welcome to a special EWTN bookmark. I'm meeting with Monica Fitzgibbons, who along with the, her husband was the co-founder of De Montfort Music, talking about their musical outreach, a special bookmark. Hey, Thank great you to have that. you here. You've been on with Father Mitch with your husband in the past, yes. and only one of you could come, so we got the better half, as they oh, usually say here. Not. I'm sure your, your husband would agree wholeheartedly <laughs> with that. And we wanted to talk about these wonderful music that, that you've been involved in, uh, the Benedictine Sisters, which uh, people are very familiar with. We've run some clips, uh, Advent and Angels and Saints. But, you know, you've got a very interesting background. It's not that you came out of uh, seeing choir at a convent school and suddenly decided to do this. How did you end up, you and your husband, both came out of the business, mm -hmm. uh, to do something like this? How did that happen? Well, I, I can only say that it was the Holy Spirit, obviously, because it wasn't our big genius uh, plan mm -hmm. to be working with nuns and, you know, monks and, and other, you know, beautiful music. But um, I, I think that we have a PhD in what not to do. <laughs> okay, that's, that's a good way of putting it. Okay. <laughs> that's, that was our starting point. And um, through our, the sacrament, sacrament of marriage and just taking that little act of will towards mm -hmm. wanting something deeper in our lives, um, logging on many and hours, that. watching EWTN, oh, great, great. having that private time and space mm -hmm. to receive the graces of what you're doing here instead of being out kind of casting about, asking mm -hmm. questions. Uh, and, um, and God has been good and led us to these beautiful mm -hmm. projects each one of them we feel are gems and it has made a huge wow. impact on many hearts i would think now you've got a musical background you mm -hmm. used to play guitar and you know <laughs> i think you wanted to be you know a singer songwriter type uh and your, your husband was kind of a film guy mm -hmm. so you guys were working out in la yeah um uh, and and you were working in the music business yes. then, right? And who, name a couple of the companies people, or at least people would recognize so they'd understand your uh, credentials, as you yes. say. Well, we were, we met when we were executives. I was at DreamWorks, mm -hmm. you know, SKG, Spielberg, Katzenberg, Geffen. Mm -hmm. And Kevin was at Sony Music, mm -hmm. working with Columbia, and you know, of course there's a great legacy. So I was sort of the new and upcoming, you know, studio, and he was the old, you know, right, right. standby who, you know, had, had been around forever. Right. Now, how did you guys actually meet? We met in his boss's office, um, 550 Madison, mm -hmm. you know, the New mm -hmm. York roots. Sure. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm sure a million inappropriate things were said, but somehow we met, it and, you know, we. Um, I was transferred from New York out to Los Angeles, and um, I remember it well. We were just reminiscing. We were at, you know, some sort of backstage situation that we often found ourselves in, and we started talking about family. Mm -hmm. And I discovered that he, his parents had been married for 40 years. Uh, at the time, his dad was still alive. He's now passed. Mm -hmm. God rest his soul. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and I, you know, my parents had been married for not 40, they were younger, maybe 30 years. And we were talking about um, what, you know, what that meant to our lives, which was really strange to have that Especially kind in the of environs and the entertainment industry you're working where that was not necessarily what people are experiencing, at least in this part of their lives. Right. right? And, and it, you know, it's a great gift that our, that our parents gave to us. And, and probably that witness of just being in that environment, um, maybe <laughs> helped us find each other. Mm -hmm. We were sort of odd, I guess, mm -hmm. in that way, but, but those identities had sort of right. shrunk to the background, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and so he, he brought that out in me and I in him. And, mm -hmm. and then we just, he, he actually um, asked me out mm -hmm. and, you know, it was really love right. at first sight. Mm -hmm. Now let me ask you, you're, you're both working out there now, you're a mother of five, right? Yes. And, and you don't live there anymore. No. When was it uh, that you decided, the two of you, was it your idea, his idea? How did you come to pass on the idea of saying, you know, uh, I like what we're doing in one way, but you know, I think we're being asked to do something. Was it something like where you felt like you were being called or led to do something else? And where did that come from? Basically what ended up happening is that um, we were, you know, sort of falling in love mm -hmm. and trying to figure out, you know, 
there's something bigger happening here, and we wanted to understand, you know, what, what, how, how, how could we do this the right way? We were seeing all kinds of examples of it not going the right way. Again, you know, mm -hmm. that seems to have been our way is to see what wasn't working and mm -hmm. then try to find... That's your PhD. You that, there's right. my PhD. So uh, I think two things happen in short, three things. Number one, um, I was working at a show, which will remain nameless, and, um, you know, God bless, some guy had just taken it upon himself to fly, you know, John 316 above this concert. You're kidding. And the group that I was working with, very famous bunch of rock mm. people, um, incited the crowd to sort of rebel against that. Mm -hmm. And I realized that I loved our Lord, mm -hmm. uh, you know. And then pretty soon after that, I saw the Passion of the Christ with my husband. Yeah. Impact and on I, a lot of people. Yeah, and I was like, I don't know if I want to see it. I'm mm -hmm. kind of light when mm -hmm. it comes to violence. And, wow. But really early on in that movie, there was a scene where somebody spat upon our Lord. Mm -hmm, right. And again, I just knew that I loved him. Mm -hmm. And I and almost connected it back to that concert in yeah. the sense that that's what was happening. Right. right. In a so way, right? Yeah. there was a relationship. Right. And I didn't know that really for sure before. Interesting. Okay. And so then that led me to actually read the entire New Testament. And I would sort of right. tell my husband, okay, do you know about this? Mm -hmm. And so then the EWTN and, and... So were you the first one out of the gate then? I, I think that he, um, d well, see, now we'll take, uh, I'll channel him the okay. better half. Right. I think when we started dating, he realized that, you know, I was like, should I be like what they say in like Cosmo? And right. should I, you know, and, and he, he wanted somebody respectful. Right. And so he was trying, he actually, as the man, was trying to guide me towards a more mm -hmm. respectful way of presenting myself in the relationship, but I had nothing to go on. Right. And so um, I think it was really through the love mm -hmm. with him that he wanted to clean up his, you know, you really, really right. encouraged to stay a perpetual boy right. in that business. Right, sure. Right. You will lose your job if you grow up b beyond 13, you know. Right. So unfortunately, the whole baby boomer generation wants to stay young. Yeah. So he, he recognized that. So mm -hmm. it was sort of converted. I mean, it is a miracle that we... Got there. Kind of found each other but and connected. We were weak, and not everybody's like this, but we just could not get any further with all the Los mm -hmm. Angeles celebrity, and we were very entrenched in that. And we started, and then the third thing was we had our first child. Well, that's always a big game changer, isn't it? You really it can have be to the chance. big game changer for people. Yeah. So when you decided to do this and you decided you wanted to go and do something different, did you go with the idea, we're going to go and make music with Benedictine <laughs> sisters or go around and find uh, monks in different uh, places and make music? That didn't quite happen that way. What did no. happen? Well, we first we set up this Aim Higher Entertainment because we did have friends who wanted to do smaller projects, but they were having all kinds of licensing issues. Mm -hmm. And because we, you know, knew how to do that, had the connections to easily clear things, we were sort of thinking, oh, you know, we'll just be sort of philanthropists on the side and right. help people. Right. And then uh, somebody gave us a first-class relic of um, St. Catherine Labre, mm -hmm. and uh, very quickly my husband said, oh, we've got to, you know, we were watching how sort of monks and nuns were being put out by different record labels. When we saw those came out a yes. few years back you and remember everything. the right. chant. And, so, right, sure. And, and all with, I'm absolutely sure, good intentions, but, you know, you have to really protect their image and likeness. You, you really want to make sure they get a, a very favorable royalty rate. I mean, right. these people are giving And sometimes they can everything. be taken advantage of. Because, yes. Right. And, and it's just not that they're specifically being singled out. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, people don't make a lot of money off their CDs. It's off of their merchandising and touring, and it's just become accepted. Right, right. But we challenged that model without getting into specifics, and um, an old boss of mine helped us to put together this model that Kevin and I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And um, lo and behold, you know, our logo for De Montfort ends up being, you know, this back of the miraculous metal. And um, so you started De Montfort along with as a division of AIM Higher Entertainment. Yes, That's what it is. Exactly. Okay. So you're still doing 
two different. Yes. You're still doing things. What would fit under? I mean, the De Montfort, I guess, would fit the, you know, angels and saints and Advent and uh, the Dominican sisters. Right, Dominican sisters Mata and Eucharistia. right. Yeah. Those would fit. What would be a project you might be doing still now that would f fit under the aim higher entertainment? Right, and that's more just sort of an eclectic thing mm -hmm. that but still sort of in keeping with our truth and beauty uh, seeking. And uh, so we have a project coming out, for example, October 7th. Mm -hmm. um, it's the boys of St. Paul's Choir in okay. Harvard Square, which is, I mean, it's a project that's near and dear to me because as I mentioned to you mm -hmm. off air that um, I went to Boston University okay. and I would go and see them, their Christmas concert. They were, you know, they've been around for 50 years but never have they been at the level that they're at now uh, with the pastor there, Father Dre, having recruited this John Robinson um, mm -hmm. from the UK who grew up in this boys choir academy tradition. And so this is the only Catholic boys choir school in the entire United States. Mm -hmm. And it's at its very top. So we wanted to, you know, we wanted to go in and record a real classic Christmas album that people could really celebrate the nativity of our Lord. And, uh, you know, it is just, I mean, it's one of the most beautiful things that I've ever heard. Really? And, and it I, was Kevin's idea to do oh, this. Oh, great. And also, I think we might be able to get a little preview and take a look at that right now. It's a tradition which dates back a very, very long way to the days when a fine education could be got from the monks. The history of the boy soprano is really ancient. We don't really know exactly when they started to be singing with the monks, but it's a great opportunity to be able to sing this kind of music, this kind of traditional boys choir music, which people don't really get too much of a chance to hear simply because there are not many boys choirs in the United States. Okay, so when we see something like that, I mean, let's talk about what it costs to do something like that. I mean, because one of the things I, I know from my experience in the business and even coming to EWTN, one of the toughest things these days, people sometimes say, how come I don't see this old show or that show? It's not because the rights for the TV show are the problem. Many times it's the rights to the music yeah. that is the biggest issue. Right. Now you guys obviously have some background and maybe you figured it out, but it must be a fairly costly project to do something like that. Well, um, I think it starts with the intention and the project itself, and then we do all kinds of crazy. <laughs> I always describe it as like, and I'm, maybe you can relate to this, I always feel like what we're doing with these projects is like the Apollo 13 Lem mm. is in you know space trying to get back to Earth with some duct tape and mm. some tin right, foil, okay. and, right, right, right. and yet then this beautiful, fruitful result takes place. It's, it's almost like we're passengers and we only get to see the very next step. Lamp unto my feet is the... Lamp unto my feet. Right. I have always loved that song. Right, right, right. Um, and then, you know, but the other practical side of it is that we have struck a deal with Universal oh, okay. because we have those relationships mm -hmm. and they distribute these worldwide for us mm -hmm. and uh, it's it's been a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you know, we've had to go into that relationship with you know, here's here's what it is, and mm -hmm. you know, I just think that it's it's been a benefit for both of us. Well, let me ask you about that. Obviously, you can get in the door because you know these people, but if these projects weren't working, you probably wouldn't get back in the door, or they might say, "We love you, but yeah. we're not going to go forward." So how how have these? Uh, which was the first one you actually worked on? The first one was Advent at Ephesus. Okay, Advent at Ephesus, which I think we ran. Uh, oh yes. uh, a piece on. The, on the air as well, which we can at least maybe see some images from that. So now this was with the Benedictines of Mary, Queen of the Apostles. Now my understanding is that you have a very professional, deliberate process of yes. how you review material and decide who you're going to work with. Why don't you go through that really professional process you had of picking these sisters? Right. Well, uh, we don't know who picked who, okay. but <laughs> again, there's a supernatural connection. What, I mean, really it's made easy with mm -hmm. the Benedictines and Mary because the mother superior, here's a whole nother amazing thing. She has a background in classical music. She was a top seat in the um, 
the Columbus Symphony Orchestra, okay. top French horn player, but also could have gone either way with mm -hmm. voice or a, you know, an instrumentalist. She graduated from the Shepherd School of Music at Rice mm -hmm. and is just incredibly talented. So having worked with all these different musicians, we then, you know, took mm -hmm. a leap of faith and went into, we all, they did, we did, and went into this recording right. situation. And, you know, I brought a Grammy, Kevin and I wanted to bring a Grammy award winning producer mm -hmm. in to make it sound as beautiful as it sounds when you're there in their chapel. But Mother mm -hmm. will take a song and arrange it. And, I mean, it just, her harmonies right. are so rich. And, I mean, just any music lover will, mm -hmm. will take that and just, you know, be amazed by yeah. it. And there have been times where something's not working and the producer will say, okay, these, this just isn't working. And she'll say, you know, okay, well, let me go back. And, mm -hmm. you know, two seconds later, there's this beautiful So she does thing. all the arranging and everything. Yes. Right. Well, let me ask you that. What I was thinking, I guess, was you had indicated at one time that the, your son had pulled them yes. out of a pile and, and you happened to play them right in your right. car on a trip. And that's really when you really fell in love with them, right? This is true. We right. somebody had so do you allow us. him to pick all the uh, <laughs> all the groups coming out, or have you changed the process? Well, him? we do play <laughs> things for him, but okay. he's now he's you know asked us to print out the lyrics of the boys' choir, and he's trying to learn how to sing, you know, those high pure tones that oh, the right. boys do. Right. Now you've had three. You have three different uh, CDs with the Benedictines, right? Yes, is that right? Correct. Okay, you got one on Lent, Angels and Saints, which was another one that we we featured on Absolutely. on EWTN. Now, when did the uh, Dominican Sisters of Mary's uh, Mater Eucharisti? When did that get into the mix? Was that in the middle of this? At the end yes. of this process? Okay. Well, in the middle of all this, but we actually knew the Dominican Sisters of Mary before the Benedictines, mm -hmm. and we'd always wanted to record their vessels. Everybody knows the Dominican. Everybody Sisters. knows <laughs> them. They're great, <laughs> They're great you know, right. ambassadors right. for Christ, and right. they. Um, you know, they are so great. They have a public um, ability to come to their Vespers. Mm -hmm. And so we went to that very early on in our faith journey and we just thought, oh my goodness, that's the most beautiful thing we've ever heard. So we were always after them to, you know, you gotta share this with more people and get it to the mm -hmm. masses. And and then I found out from uh, from them that they had some songs that they had actually written themselves. Okay. And and the Benedictines have written some of their own songs, but these the these um, you know they're very mm. much to Jesus through Mary. Right. So it was it was so great. So Monfort fits perfectly with that, of course, yes. as well with Jesus to Mary. Well, let me ask you about that too, because obviously, Truth and Light, we have our our our, our program with the sisters. We've had them yes. on for many years as well. Uh, so they're great. So what would be a seller? I mean, if something goes out there and you market this out there, mm -hmm. uh, what, what are the numbers you're looking at? And I'm wondering, and since you said Universal sells it worldwide, uh, should it be fair, uh, most of the sales in the United States, or how does that break down? Just interesting. Yes, but they're very much, you know, in all the, you know, you're going to have Italy and France, the UK. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, you know, we're starting to get more interest in South America now. Okay. I attribute that to, you know, the Holy Father. Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. you know, God gave us these 12 tones. And, you know, our theme has been that we've seen all different incarnations, you know, through music, all different genres of music. And, um, I think that we've just kind of felt called to preserve these mm -hmm. because we're seeing their lifestyle and they're, you know, they're they're singing and they're doing these vespers and the, right. you know, the psalms and the, you know, their different rule of lives and and the church has always the world, not the church, you know, Vivaldi, mm -hmm. you know, is a priest. Right. The world has always had this in the culture, and. And we wanted it in our culture, in our family, as you know, mm -hmm. if you're going to put something on shuffle, this should be in the <laughs> library. Right. And and so I I think that seems to be where we're at. And now we've gotten all this feedback of you know people are birthing their children to this music. They're oh using it as background music yes. for that. Oh wow. Okay. They're dying to the music. Right. They're um, you know I mean. Autistic children have been calmed. Yeah, comforting one yes. way or the other in, in, in all aspects of life then, in the beginning and the end, really. Yes. Um, one other way to answer your question is that 
we also, with our background, um, we have these relationships with the secular media mm -hmm. that we've maintained, and they have really, really picked up on these projects. Mm -hmm. So, do you think some of them actually have their, uh, at least on the side, feel good about doing this? That they get some positive aspect themselves, at least some of them? I think they may, whether they know it or not. Mm -hmm. But again, because the production is good and the, the right. singers are right. awesome, they're just attracted, I think, to the beauty first. Right. And I know you've had several discussions here at EWTN about that, sure. how attracting that is. Right. Well, we witnessed that firsthand. Yeah. Father Dubay always used to talk about that. Yes. Uh, uh, you know, with beauty. Yeah, uh, so h what would be a good selling CD for you when you you put this out and it gets sold out? What would it be? And and do the sisters use these a lot for fundraising things too? And is it mostly through hard CDs? Or is it a lot of downloads? Is it offered through Amazon, all of the above? Yes. Okay. Um, and of course, it's here at the at EWTN, EWTN Religious Catalog. Religious catalog. Yes. Catalog. We were not forget. Wonderful, you can get it from there, <laughs> believe me. <laughs> uh, I, it's been used as all of the above, mm -hmm. but it's been for sale. And um, for example, if you go to the sisters' website, it's a little higher of a price, but you know that you're donating. Right. right. Well, it's kind of what we try and say with catalog. You know, we know you can get it someplace else, right. maybe cheaper, but you realize that you're helping support the work here at the right. same time. Right. And so we've encouraged, you know, mm -hmm. the EWTM purchase and the and mm -hmm. going to the sisters, but. You know, we also very much want it to be accessible in the digital age that we live in. And when we first went into um, to Universal, they're like, "Oh, you know, even our best-selling classical titles will sell like 20% digitally mm -hmm. these days because people want, you know, that rich, you know, right, music." Right, right, right. But because you know the HD tracks and the the technology has you know right, not so much progressed. Better. Right, right. I mean, we do extremely well on the digital side, mm -hmm. which, you know, to me shows that we have sort of got a wide spectrum of people who are enjoying this music, and that, you know, that really makes us happy. Mm -hmm. So your your project that's coming up is the Boys of St. Paul's Choir School. So that's a CD. Yes. Now, is there also a video or a film or something being done at the same time with that, or do you do those together? Yes. Okay. And so what we do is we knowing that you know we just think in a visual way mm -hmm. music is very become very visual mm -hmm. so we we try to get as much behind the scenes of the recording and their life there okay. in the community and you know to go in there and see these boys um, you know learning how mm -hmm. to sing like this you coming from you know other schools and not necessarily a music background mm -hmm. and then to see how much father dre incorporates it into the liturgy um, I mean, no matter what mass it is, whether the boys are singing in their sweet spot or if they progress beyond that voice, mm -hmm. he'll have a scola, he'll have them playing the organ. Okay. I mean, there's no sense of utilitarianism with okay. this school, which is what I, you know, can happen. I was going to ask you, how much is a faith perspective? Is it is that there? underpinning everything that's going on. Very much so. Okay. And and then he also it's this sort of, you know, well rounded mm -hmm. community there because he also oversees the Harvard, you know, Catholic Center there. Mm -hmm. So you've got, you know, this intersection of truth, beauty, and then education. I mean it's he's casting a wide right. net. And so you know, they're singing at this very high level. The acoustics at St. Paul are incredible. So that's where we recorded it, right there. Right. We like to record in people's natural environment. So you get the full feel of yeah. what it's like. Yeah, we don't want it to be artificial and, you know, in a studio okay. and all that. Okay, so not 75 tracks, 800 yeah. tracks later. And <laughs> We're not cutting and splicing. But I can, you know. yeah. Well, let me ask you with that, too, because uh, we have our in concert show, which uh, mm -hmm. we, we have here on EW10, always been popular. And one of the thoughts has always been not only for Catholics, you know, to hear sacred music because you don't hear any, but that that's also a crossover. It that, is. That, that's a place where you can reach a lot of people because a lot of people probably, if you took a survey someplace who listened to, to kind of high-end music like that, many times can be more secular than probably the norm. This is true. And so it's it's a great way of re reaching into that group. I Have agree. you seen any or gotten feedback in that way? Yes, because they tend to be categorized as classical right. due to the repertoire and the public domain nature right. of the material. And the text is obviously religious in nature. Now you'll find Latin right, and include, English. Right, include booklets with the right, CDs and stuff. Translations right. and things right. like that. But I think by the time that they 
you know, have this music, they mm -hmm. just, you know, have realized, you know, this is, you know, charting at the top of the classical music charts. It holds its own against all the new renditions yeah. and they feel okay about, yeah. you know, getting involved with it. And maybe they find themselves humming some sacred texts in Latin. They don't even realize until they realize what they're about. Yeah. We're just out of time. Thank you so much, Monica, for the Thank fine you, work you Doug. and your husband. Kevin are doing with the De Montfort music and Angels and Saints and Advent in Ephesus and uh, our Dominican sisters, our good friends, and of course, Lent at Ephesus and a new one with St. Paul's. We look forward to that. And they're all available through the EWTN Religious Catalog. Keep up the great work. Thank you so much. Thank you for Join us next time on Bookmark.